Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm happy to introduce our school physician, Dr. Bert Mandelbaum, and the Hillsborough Township Health Officer, Siobhan Spano, who offered to be here tonight to discuss COVID-19 school considerations. This presentation is being recorded, and any questions or comments may be sent to us via the Google Doc. Dr. Feltry, Mr. Handler, and Mr. Callahan will be monitoring and, answer, and ask, um, asking the questions to Dr. Mandelbaum and Ms. Spano for answers. So without further ado, I will start the presentation. Dr. Mandelbaum. Hey, everybody. Um, Siobhan, are you okay as before, if I go through the presentation, yeah, sure. we'll chime in? Nope, that's um, fine. No, I awesome. love the presentation. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to get settled. So I appreciate you guys. I apologize for the camera moving. I'm just trying to get into a comfortable position so I could talk to everybody. Um, and I'm going to just initiate the conversation by saying this is a conversation about how to keep everybody safe um, when we return to school. So we know we're going to be returning to school at some point. We want to do everything we can to make sure um, students and faculty alike are safe. And in order to do that, we have to understand the disease and what we know about it, how it's spread. Once we understand how it's spread, we can understand what our mitigation strategies are. And then we'll talk about some specifics that relate to school. Uh, it's probably 50 slides or so. It's probably going to take about an hour to get through. I'll talk as fast as I can. Um, but And then afterwards, we'll handle any questions. And just to let you know the kind of background of where I'm pulling this information from. So I'm a practicing pediatrician. Um, we have a, I have a large practice in central New Jersey. We have, um, we've been open throughout. So we've experienced what faculty right now is experiencing for those that are getting back, the working through COVID and understanding what that means. Um, I am also the chair of pediatrics at Penn Medicine, Princeton Health. And through that, I've been on their COVID leadership team, which means for the last six months, we've only really talked about um, COVID, how to keep staff and patients safe, PPE, how this disease is spread, and we've watched and learned from that. Um, and obviously, I'm the school physician. I'm also a parent of a rising eighth and ninth grader. And my sister is an educator in Monroe. My brother is a professor. My mom is a teacher. So I am well aware of how this impacts everyone. And again, this is just coming from a point of a conversation to say, what do we know? Let's work together to make this as safe as possible. So with that being said, let's go to the next slide. So these are, again, our objectives, understand what the disease is, how it's transmitted. Therefore, we can understand the mitigation strategies, what kind of medical policies we want to have in school. We're going to try to hit the commonly asked questions. The questions that are going through your mind um, have been asked on national forums. So for the most part, I think most of them will be addressed. And then again, we'll take our time to go through afterwards and ask, answer any other questions or clarify points that you're unclear on. Um, this is not about should we or shouldn't we open school and when we should do this, okay? This is just about um, how to keep it safe. Next slide. So what do we know about the virus? W what we know is that this virus is primarily spread through droplets, and there are two ways that those droplets are spread. The most likely way that this disease is spread at this point, we think, is face-to-face -face spread through droplets. And what that means is you could see the picture on the left side of your screen. There's an infected gentleman um, or an infected person, and they close enough proximity, droplets come out of their mouth and hit someone else in either their mouth, nose, or eyes. That could be from coughing, that could be from breathing heavy, and those droplets we'll talk about are heavy, they go only a certain amount of distance and they fall to the ground. The second way that it's spread through droplets are that uh, contact with droplets, and we'll touch on this as well, but the droplets themselves touching the skin do not cause an issue, you have to touch the droplets and then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Aerosolization, which is possible with this virus, is not the primary route of spread, and we're going to talk about when we see that and how we can try to mitigate that as well. Next slide. So this is going to be the primary way that disease is spread, which means this is where we should spend the most amount of energy trying to reduce transmission. 
And again, this is an infected person having droplets. They would have to come out of their mouth, and everyone has seen droplets leave their mouth when they're talking. You can actually visibly see them sometimes. They travel a certain amount of distance. We generally think three, four feet. It, you know, we rarely think that it goes more than six feet, though it is possible in the right circumstance. Um, but they generally go, you know, three to six feet, um, and then they drop to the ground. Um, these are generally larger particles, and that's why, you know, gravity pulls on them. Next slide. And that, again, is different than um, what happens when these droplets hit a surface. So the droplets can, this virus, which is a protein, it's an RNA protein that is wrapped in an envelope of this fatty layer, um, and it could survive outside of the body for a small amount of time. Um, that time depends on what the surface is, so um, different surfaces, but it's anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days. It also depends on other environmental factors. So um, being, you, you know, humidity is not good for it. Uh, humidity is actually, it thrives a little bit more in humidity. It doesn't thrive as well in a dry environment. Regardless though, the virus cannot get into the body through the skin. So you could take your hands and stick it in a vat of mucus filled with virus and nothing would happen um, as long as you wash your hands after it. The problem is when you don't wash your hands and you take that and then you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And we've talked about in prior talks about this, in the how common it is. And, you know, uh, the what I use is there was a um, public health officer, sorry, Siobhan, um, but who was giving a talk and really emphasizing back in the early portion of this, we really were afraid it was very much droplet spread. So everyone was, you know, watching their mail and the grocery stayed in your garage and the public health officer was emphasizing how much people touch their eyes, nose, or mouth without realizing it and you can't do that and as she's giving her talk that's televised she then licks her finger and turns the page and so it is that um, it, it is that innate for many people and, and subconscious so it really does take relearning not to do that. Cleaning and hand washing can co co totally prevent this. Um, again if it doesn't, it, it, there's multiple steps. You have to touch your hands, you then have to not wash it, and then touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. So if you cleaned the surface and it wasn't there, it, it, this is relatively amenable to multiple cleaners. The EPA has a list of them, so they are not hard to get. Um, or if you wash your hands, it, you could stop the virus from spreading. And again, this is no longer what we think the primary way of it's being spread. Next slide. Aerosolization. So there's been a lot of talk about aerosolization. Um, Aerosolization is not the way that this is spread. We see aerosolization in certain viruses like measles, tuberculosis, and it's a combination of can it is can you have small enough particles that can be blown via you know kind of air movement, and what is the inoculum? How many of those particles do you need to get sick? So one of the nice things that actually we'll come back to talk about, we think with this virus, there's some good data to show that the more virus you're exposed to, um, the sicker you get, and the less virus you're exposed to, the milder the illness, which is one of the reasons masks ends up being, end up being such an important part of our mitigation strategies, because even just getting a little bit of droplets, um, it makes a big difference. So with aerosolization, um, most, of this, most of the virus are in these kind of large, heavy particles that fall to the ground. Certain events can cause aerosolization. Um, we know like in a hospital setting, it can cause aerosolization with things like intubation. So if you're irritating the airway. Um, we've seen that, we've seen kind of um, media reports of aerosolization in very specific crowded, um, crowded uh, places, bars, uh, choir early on in Seattle where there was not a lot of airflow, someone's sick and people close together. And we're going to talk about super spreaders in a moment. And so in certain situations, you can see that aerosolization, but we do not see that going through buildings. So we do not see that in supermarkets and hospitals, we are not seeing people getting sick through aerosolization. And if we did, um, New York and China would have had a, a much higher incidence just given the burden of disease and the proximity of people. Next slide. So we already said uh, this is primarily droplet spread. You could see this gentleman and you could see the spray coming, that darker circle um, at, right close to his mouth. They can see that's where the more droplets are. And the further you get away, the kind of the more droplets disperse. And so you could see that kind of scatter um, as you get into, um, you know, these really, really small particles. Um, again, you can get into potential for aerosolization, but 
we are really focused on that this is primarily droplet spread. Um, and so having masking and physical distancing are going to be what our keys are. Next slide. Um, we don't have to, you can save, you can pause this. And I'll skip it so you don't have to watch the whole slide. But Magic Loogies, if you remember the Seinfeld episode, um, Jerry was talking, Kramer and Newman came in and they were talking about how they were at a baseball game and Keith Hernandez had spit on them and it hit Kramer, bounced off his head and hit Newman. And then it, uh, Jerry is describing it. It's like a JFK reenactment where it stops midair and uh, then lands on Newman's left leg. And Jerry's like, that is one Magic Loogie. And so the point is that is not how droplets move so they don't move they move in a very predictable straightforward pattern the majority the large droplets so being behind someone um, is much better than being in front of them which is why you'll see the strategies in terms of tables and classes are not to have the kids kind of facing each other but to have two kids side by side next slide so let's talk about high risk exposures and this is going to come into play a little later when we talk about how um, our public health officials would interact in terms of quarantining people. So the definition of a high risk exposure is being within six feet of someone. That's the distance that we think these droplets can typically carry for a long enough time. Initially, we said 10, then the guidelines changed to 15 minutes. New Jersey might use 10 minutes. It, it's splitting hairs. But the idea is that there's enough time that you are face to face with someone where this droplet can likely come from their mouth and hit your mouth, nose, or eyes. In the medical arena, um, if we're wearing mask and eye protection, that is not considered an exposure. So you would think that in the school arena, that would be the same. Um, in general, as we start school, the public health officials are not going to consider mask and eye protection in the exposure calculation. We think it's going to be very much effective and protective, but just when they're coming to figure out who might need to be quarantined. That point of quarantining being, we're going to move you home to a 14 day period where if you get sick, you're not exposing someone. Um, they're not gonna consider mask and eye protection. So it's going to be 15 minutes, six feet, which means in most classes, it obviously you exceed 15 minutes. The rule is therefore gonna be six feet. If the public health officials can come in and say the kids, especially older kids, were at their desks, the desks were more than six feet apart, and they predominantly stayed at their desk, it doesn't mean that they didn't pass each other in the hallway, and it doesn't mean that they didn't walk up to throw something in the garbage, but they were predominantly in their desk, um, and everyone could confirm that, that class would not be, need to be exposed. Same thing if the, I mean, not need to be quarantined. Same thing if the teacher was up in the front of the room. If it is a younger class and they are not in their seats because they're normal first or second graders and they're running around um, and there was an exposure, so there was a, a student who was a probable or confirmed case, um, they would likely then quarantine the whole class. And we're going to get into that a little bit more um, towards the end. So just to reiterate the mask point, we're going to drive home a few of these principles to help you both in school and outside. Um, the column on the left are the are the column of people who are sick. The column on the right are the healthy, susceptible people. And you can see when both people have masks on, they fall into this very low risk of spread. When nobody has a mask on, the spread is obviously higher. And if you had one mask to give to someone, you want to put that mask on the person who's sick. Because again, this is droplet transmission. The more you can cut the droplets out of their mouth, um, the less likely you are for face-to-face -face transmission and the less likely you are to have the potential for droplets on the ground or on a surface that you can then have contact with. Next slide. So to make our understanding a bit about this more complicated, I'm going to give you some facts. What you know, How to interpret these facts, it is really difficult, but I just want, I, I want to expand everyone's understanding of this. So first, it's important to talk about asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, and symptomatic. So symptomatic is easy, right? We think 60% of this disease is spread through symptomatic people. We understand what that is. If you're sick and you're coughing, um, you could spread it. Now, ideally, um, we, we as a community are pulling together and symptomatic people are not going out anymore. Um, but we'll, and we'll address symptomatic students in school and what happens. Um, pre-symptomatic people are people who in the day or two before you become symptomatic. So what we'll typically use to explain that um, are, you know, teachers, educators, parents, that you always intuitively knew if a child got sick 
and presented this evening with flu-like symptoms, likely they were, were contagious earlier today when they were in school. That's actually how most of these school illnesses spread. Um, they were likely contagious this morning, even though they didn't recognize they had symptoms, maybe they were contagious yesterday, they were likely not contagious a week ago, right? So it's the run up to recognizing that they have symptoms. Um, and that is the pre symptomatic period. During that period, they are asymptomatic, so they don't recognize they have symptoms. So that is the majority the 40% of people who are asymptomatic, the majority of that spread is actually in this pre symptomatic stage, right before they get sick. It gets a little bit muddier because there is a subset of people who don't recognize they have symptoms or they have mildish symptoms and they attribute it to other things. My allergies are acting up. Oh, I just didn't sleep well last night. And there are some stoic people who just can, you know, marshal through um, not feeling well and feel like they have to go to school or go to work. So those people are not necessarily reporting that they have symptoms, yet they might have mild symptoms. So that is what we think are the majority of these asymptomatic spread are either people who will show symptoms or people who have mild symptoms that haven't recognized it. We do not think that there are all that there's a lot of spread of from asymptomatic people who never recognize it. So now we got caught up in the definitions early on with the WHO, but that is the clarity on what, how they believe it is spread right now and why where the confusion came from words. So again, it's usually the couple of days before they start showing signs that they get sick. Now, another fact about here is that we think that most disease, so they'll say, epidemiologists will say 70 to 80% of the cases are spread from 20, maybe 30% of the people, usually in these super spreader events, which generate a ton of headlines. So there's a lot of clickbait on this where, you know, there's headlines of these, you know, these things that come up and they are usually in these situations. And then in a, in a moment, we're going to show you what the situations might be, but it's these situations where it's crowded and you have someone who's sick who doesn't recognize it. And there's a few other mitigating factors that end up leading to a lot of people getting sick. But you can counter that fact with the fact that household spread, so 70% so, well, of people don't spread it at all. And in households, the data is about one in five people in a household get sick. So if there's someone in your house who had COVID, eight 80% of those people in that household, four out of five won't get sick. Even more so spouses. Spouses have the highest rate of contagion. Um, and that's somewhere around 30%, just a little bit shy of that. That means you can have a spouse in your house, seven to 10 days being sick, you helping to take care of them. And you have a better shot than not of not getting sick. So we have to combine these two facts that, you know, there can be these super spreader events, but yet oftentimes, most people don't get sick even when they live in the house with somebody with it. Next slide. So these super spreader events, there's the, the top three lines are um, issues related to the individual. So we know that there's sometimes of some immunologic characteristics that allow people to have higher viral loads. The, the higher your viral load, the more likely that there's more virus in your droplets and the more likely it is that you can infect somebody. Co-pathogens, this means that you have another infection. So we, um, when we get to the data on kids, we know that kids don't get that sick. Doesn't mean that they can't get very sick, but imagine a child having a mild infection with COVID. If they had another infection like the flu, they might be coughing because of the flu and that might make them spread this a little easier. And then there's behavioral issues and whether that's choosing not to wear masks, not practicing social distancing, not washing your hands, not covering your mouth. So that is all out of our control. What is out under our control are the crowding events um, and why physical distancing really you know, is important. Um, and so this is where we're really going to try to control it and not have these large events. And this is what's going on in parts of the country. So the, you know, 700 people Jackson parties or house parties going on in North Jersey, they are generally not helpful. Um, this is where the super spreader events can happen. Next slide. So what do we know about COVID and kids? Um, we are learning. Um, most of what you've heard is true. So uh, anything that you've heard that's an absolute is not true. Um, kids can't get it. Kids can't spread it. 
But the younger they are, the lower the prevalence of disease in them. Um, that's definitely been true. 10 seems to be a cutoff, at least as we're doing, you know, kind of data aggregation. Um, we also know that they're less symptomatic. Um, with there are as educators, um, we know that you can't lump kids together. So we know that teens act more like adults and their bodies are more like adults and their disease gets closer to act like young adult disease. Um, some of the reasons for this, there's some interesting thoughts. So one that seems to be really plausible and seems to be bearing out is that um, the, the spike protein binds to these ACE2 receptors. And um, for some reason, ACE2 receptors increase in age. So the older you are, the more you have. And so the less ACE2 receptors you have, the less opportunity you have for that virus to get into the cell to cause damage and get you sick. So um, that is one reason. Another kind of plausible theory out there is that from a physics perspective, we think that this is droplet spread and these droplets don't rise. They generally go straight and then drop down. Most of the time, the students, so other than, you know, the kind of older kids are not bigger than you. So they're, uh, they're shorter than you, which means those droplets are not coming up to your face. They're kind of going in a path and then dropping down. So um, that is one reason as at least that we think we might not be seeing um, child to adult transmission. Most of the time in our experience, the disease, when kids have had this, it's been adult to child transmission. We, knew, we know kids can get sick much less frequently than um, older adults. So far, the data in the short term is really good um, uh, uh, regarding kids. And we're learning about this, what we call MISC, this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, we'll learn more as we go. Luckily, kids getting sick have been rare. MISC, this post-infectious issue that we think is kind of immune mediated is really rare even in the kids who get sick. So there was again some a, a lot of media coverage of this. We right now we're about 500 cases or so in the country uh, and they've all they they're generally there's been a few deaths but even those 500 cases almost all of them have recovered beautifully. Next slide. So this is about the transmission, you know, this data changes so quickly but kids are generally less than 10% of the cases, even though they make up 20 to 25% of the population. And, and um, if you had to draw up a disease, this is what you would want. You would not want it impacting kids. Um, so we're thankful for that. Next slide. All right. And of course, everything I'm saying, as far as we know, what I, I am giving you the culmination of all the experience I have and this has been all consuming for me from every aspect of my job roles. And I am on mul multiple kind of national forums as we're talking about this, but no matter what, we've only known about this virus for, you know, since December, January, our United States experience is the last six months. So we're learning and there's been some really reassuring stories, especially like as play the more places are open, the more we'll learn. So we have data from daycares, YMCAs in New York City. They seem great. We're hearing a lot of super spreader events, but I would just caution everyone as we're understanding what this is and the mitigation strategies, you have to, we're going to get into what the prevalence is and what you're doing about that. So you have to compare apples to apples. Um, a lot of these headlines are clickbait and you'll hear about stories in Georgia and Indiana. And when you actually read it, you could see that they were making really poor decisions, opening in high prevalence areas, either not having any mitigation strategies or not enforcing them. Um, and a lot of that is no surprise. So we can't to be careful not to learn from um, poor data. Next slide. So that brings us to how are we going to handle this? So I don't think that this is a question of whether you should or not open school or not open school. Um, I think the question is, how do you try to figure out how safe it is? Um, and what is the likelihood that people would get sick as you're looking at the, the safety aspects of it? And the most important issue is to start with a low prevalence. So if you have almost no disease in the community, no matter what you do, you're going to look like a rock star. Your mitigation strategies are going to look great. Um, if you have a high prevalence, it is going to be really, really difficult to protect everyone from getting sick. So um, it isn't that we everyone knows opening school is important. 
but the idea is you need to we need to start by looking at what the prevalence is and if we have a low prevalence you're in a much better spe much better place to think that your other strategies will be helpful um, then your strategies need to be based on everything we talked about so they need to be based on science how is this spread how can you kind of get the most bang for your buck minimize harm um, and understanding that we're going to do the best we can, but because no single intervention is perfect, the more you can layer on top of it, the better these strategies will look. Next slide. All right, so what do you want to see? Um, there's no absolute consensus on this. Um, there's a few points that New Jersey is starting to look at, and this is the conversations that people have been having across the country probably for the last month as they looked at community-wide data, county-specific or, um, you know, for Hillsborough, we're going to be looking at Somerset County, Hunterdon County, and Mercer County. Um, that is how New, um, New Jersey is calling them Central West, and they'll be um, putting those counties together. So one is you want to look at the percent positivity. So this is test positivity for COVID-19. And obviously, the more tests you do on less symptomatic people, the lower this percent positivity is going to be. The reason you want to see it less than 5% is uh, when we started doing tests, you can only, we were only able to do tests on hospitalized patients and our percent positivity was like 67%. So you want to see a, per, a low percent positivity because that means that you have enough tests that you can test people. Um, and right now, you know, we have, New Jersey has been under 4%. I think we're around 2% or so. Um, the second thing you want to look at are daily new cases. This is more of a kind of uh, population comparison. And so the general rule of thumb, a lot of people are saying you want to have less than five cases per 100,000 over a seven day average. What do people generally think are high are 10 cases um, per 100,000. So California was at like, let's say mid 20s or so. And they were saying they should consider opening at less than seven. Um, I think Somerset County, when I looked today, was at like two at two cases per 100,000. And um, Siobhan, I don't know if you have data um, about that off the top of your head. Uh, she might be having technical issues. Yeah, so I think I will, she we'll um, mistakenly left the meeting instead of taking herself yeah. off mute. I'm sure she'll yeah. come back. No, yeah, not not an issue. But um, that is, so our cases right now, we are hit, meeting both of those criteria. The other thing you want to have is an infection rate under one. So New Jersey has really been great. We've been hovering under one and around one all summer long. Um, when infection at its height, we were at two to three. So that means for every person who was sick, two to three more people would get sick. And that's where you get exponential growth. Just as an FYI, to compare this to truly aerosolized diseases like measles, the infection rate is around 19. So, um, and this infection rate is somewhat, um, it, it's not just the virus itself and how it's spread, um, but what kind of mitigation strategies you do. And um, Siobhan, I know you just, by accident- Sorry so, about the trouble with my- uh, no, I, I was just going to say that I think you're right. It was about 2%, but I haven't looked at it today, so I don't, I'm not sure. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. But that, that's where it's been hovering, which is great. Next slide. All right. So we're going to have three main mitigation strategies. Um, the first one is obvious. Let's keep sick people out. So how do you do this? Um, the first portion of this is education. And so we need to tell, we need to educate both, both staff members not to come to work when they're sick, and we need to educate families not to send kids to school when they're sick. I am well aware that this is not how life functioned pre-COVID in any workplaces. It's not how we functioned. It's not how um, most people felt like they had to go to their jobs. They don't want to call out sick. Most families said, I don't want my child not to miss out on a day of school. They don't look that sick. I'll send them to school. Um, for the most part, the sense that we're getting from people, they've learned post-COVID that this is a new world and we can't do that. But these are going to be things that we're going to have to enforce. So we're going to have to educate people about this. 
and we're going to need policies that support it. Um, this becomes much easier when there is a virtual option um, for students. Um, the incentive to send people to school is much less when they can get education. Um, daily screenings need to be done. And in the next slide, we're going to talk about temperature screenings and why they're best done at home. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that. The other thing outside of the people who are sick and trying to keep them out is we want people who are slightly higher risk than the general population. So as our population is at a relatively kind of low to medium risk because of all the good job that we have done both as a state and in the Northeast, either exposure, which we know is a high risk, those people are supposed to be quarantined for 14 days, or travel to a any place at this point. You know, this keeps changing. I thought last, I think it was 32 states, but um, travel and international travel will increase the risk. So we're going to have to recommend um, or that and have policies that reinforce that those students should be virtual during that time. Next slide. So symptom screening. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this slide. Um, one is for your education. And the other is just to show you how this virus really could look like any other virus. There's no, especially in kids, there's no hallmark symptom. Fever, chills, muscle aches, or any respiratory symptoms. Loss of taste or smell is generally somewhat specific, but anytime you're congested, you could have this. Um, conjunctivitis, red eyes could happen anywhere. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Kids could just have GI symptoms and a severe headache. So this could happen really with any virus. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we'll talk about why aren't we taking temperatures at school. So generally, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, don't recommend it. Um, for the most part, it's just not worth the return on your investment. It is so labor intensive and has so many opportunities to misidentifying the right people. So first thing is children uh, with COVID, over half of them do not have a fever. Even if they do have a fever, for any of you guys who have kids, um, when we get our phone calls, it's almost always late evening that we're getting calls that fevers are spiking because the normal kind of you know diurnal variation of temperature is that it is lower in the morning and rises through the day. So having someone check a temperature in the morning does not necessarily mean that you're going to catch something. Um, temperature screening done in these mass centers is notoriously inaccurate, and we see this you know as Many of you might not have experienced it. We see it at the hospital um, where they're having nurses. You're using a distance and they're using, you know, these are not oral thermometers. These are kind of, you know, forehead scanning ones and they can get very, get varying temperatures. On, in our experience at the hospital, we have really found very insignificant yield. Again, it is a high utilization of resources with very little yield. And there is an argument of, well, the parents are going to lie to us. They, we know that they can circumvent it if they wanted to circumvent it by giving fever reducing medicine. So that's not going to help us. We, um, and we definitely don't want a false sense of security. This is really going to rely on us creating this trust and education in the community of which, again, we have stamped out the majority of this disease through the last six months and all the precautions we have taken. Um, I think our communities are going to buy into this, but it is the parents who know their kids best. So we really need to have them doing the screening and incentivize them not to send the kids to school if they're sick. Next slide. All right, so we kept out people who might be sick or are higher risk. Now we're gonna deal with the second step, which is what happens if someone is in school but doesn't have symptoms and they're in that pre-symptomatic stage? How do we get how do we stop them from getting sick? And this is where we're going to have to use multiple strategies. We're going to use masking. Now, we are in a great state that the um, governor has mandated masking. That is key because um, most of this is droplet, uh, spread through droplets. We are going to maximize physical distancing. So as crazy as these hybrid plans are, the goal of the hybrid plans is just to reduce students in school. That's, you know, for the most part, why school districts are doing this. And um, the further you can get the kids away from each other, the better they are. And so six feet is the goal. And if seven feet is achievable, that's better than six feet. Schools are looking at a few operational issues. So 
um, they have to come up with cleaning strategies, especially in between students, in between cohorts, and making sure they have good ventilation. So for the potential for aerosolization events, the more you can have fresh air coming in and the more you can have good airflow in the room, the better off we are. We're going to have to have improvement in hand hygiene, um, which means hand washing stations, you know, or alcohol based gels, especially before you know, eating, although we're going to avoid opportunities where exposure is likely like eating. So this is why you're going to be starting without lunch in, um, in most districts. And we're going to avoid crowds to avoid these kind of um, potential for super spreader events. And lastly, the smaller the cohort and the more consistent it is, the less opportunity you have to exposure to other kids. That not only makes it better for um, preventing disease, but it makes it easier when our public health team, um, God forbid, they have to come in and, and figure out who might have been exposed, the smaller the group and the more the easier it is to identify them and um, quarantine them to keep everyone safe. Next slide. So let's go through those strategies one more time, just because this is going to be um, the mainstay of how we're going to protect each other. So we know most of these droplets fall within three feet. You keep six feet to kind of really say we have a safe distance. Um, and in certain situations where there might be kind of more yelling, the, you know, coughing, you're going to want to have people spread apart. Next slide. Aerosolization. This, for the most part, is only the issue we're going to be worried about if we're in big crowds without masks. So this is not going to be the issue with school. Um, school nurses, are where we want to make sure that we're not doing nebulizers or limiting nebulizer use because we worry about that nebulized air. If a child was sick, whether that could spread it. So we're going to really be trying to uh, limit that. The operational people in all the districts are working on ventilation. So, and whether or not you can keep windows open, whether or not you can keep doors open, and whether that's fire hazards or shooting hazards, the more we can keep improved airflow in the rooms, the better. Um, outdoors, as difficult as that is, especially in a public school district, the more time that you could figure out how to be outdoors, the better it would be for a couple of reasons. You have automatic improvement in ventilation. Um, you have a prevention of droplet spread because there's really not a lot of surfaces that you are using um, with multiple students and you can maximize physical distancing. Next slide. So face coverings. Um, we are mandating face coverings. N95s are, these are the face coverings that are meant to protect the individual from small particles that are inhaled. So this is when we have aerosolized virus and um, the not only does it protect droplets, obviously, but it is really makes a complete seal, super uncomfortable to wear. It's hard to wear them for prolonged periods of time. In the hospital, we are only wearing them in, when we are doing aerosolization events. So events that for a COVID positive patient when we're in their airway. Otherwise, we are wearing surgical masks. And I'm going to hit this point in a couple of minutes, but just to kind of prep you guys, what we do in the hospital, we've had, call it 550 patients at Penn Medicine Princeton. Um, when we are taking care of patients in the hospital with COVID-19, we are wearing a surgical mask and we are wearing eye protection. Because we go in between patients, we'll also put a gown on. Um, and obviously, we wash our hands and wear gloves just to kind of um, protect us from spreading from room to room. Um, but to, we are wearing, uh, it, it is just with a mask and eye protection. And that has been shown to be sufficient. People are safe. They are protected. They are not getting exposed. And that is with when they're taking care of COVID-19 patients. In the school setting, we're going to allow cloth masks. Um, the idea of masks just in general, um, the more layers it has, the better it has. Just as an FYI, it's less the material and more the layers. Valved masks. Um, we're going to ask the school to put out recommendations that valved masks not be acceptable. And I know teachers have told me, families have said that they have bought the valved masks. The problem with the valve mask, and this is the, uh, the CDC recommends not allowing valve masks, is that valve is meant, it's meant for like people doing home construction and you have dust, so you're trying not to breathe it in, but then the valve opens to breathe out um, as you're exhaling. 
the purpose for the most part of these face coverings are to stop when you're breathing out and can't, and maintain your droplets. These valves open up as you breathe out, allowing the droplets to come out. So uh, people have then asked, can we put a filter behind them? And the answer would be, it would absolutely be protective, but nobody would know. And a lot of this is the not only protecting people, but ensuring that they feel protected as you're going through it. So if someone wanted to wear a valve mask and a surgical mask or a cloth mask over it, that is fine. You can always add more to something. So if we're saying you have to have a face covering and you have a cloth face covering, that is fine if you wanted to have a valve mask underneath it for some reason. But valve masks we're going to recommend as not being the sole um, method of having a mask. And we want, as this, these are um, teachers here, we would not want you to be up teaching and see kids who had valve masks and you not know whether or not they had a filter behind it. And it's impossible for you to check. Next slide. I don't know if you, any of you guys have seen this. Um, neck gaiters um, might not be effective. It was a Duke study. It was uh, last week. It was, I don't even know where we are. Everything's changing so quickly. It was this past weekend that this came out. Um, and what they looked at is that it was a, a very small study, was not looking to see if people got sick. They were just blowing air particles through. And um, the picture on number 11 was a fleece gaiter. Those gaiters are those, um, you know, coverings that can kind of be down at your neck and you could pull over your mouth and nose. And they thought that the fleece gaiter allowed too many droplets to come through, maybe even breaking them up and potentially aerosolizing them. Um, the general gist from physicians across the country right now is they're not putting too much stock in this. And so gaiters, as we get to the opening of school, we'll see if there's more recommendations. So far, the Department of Health and the CDC have not weighed in at all. If I had to give a recommendation right now, my recommendation would just be that if gaiters would be fine, but we really want to have something that has layers. So we just don't want thin spandexy material that's one layer. If you had something that is, you know, it could be cotton, it could be something else, but the more layers it is, the more protective it'll be. Next slide. Um, just to understand how to wear masks, so this is like an Onion article, the below the nose community stunned as the study shows nose connected to the lungs. So um, this gentleman is not protecting himself or anyone else. So um, he could still have droplets coming out of his nose. Um, it doesn't mean that the mask won't pull, fall down for a moment or two, but we need to educate people the face coverings cover your mouth and nose. Next slide. Face shields. There will be a point in the future we'll have better data on this. Right now, there is not enough data to say that face shields are an effective enough face covering. And the reason to protect others, the reason is on these sides, we think that droplets could come out. Now, again, those droplets generally go in one direction. We don't think that there's a lot of aerosolization. So there is a lot of uh, potential that these face shields might be very effective, but right now they're not effective. We don't know that for sure. So um, they are not being recommended to be used as a sole, as the sole protection um, for either the individual or for others. Um, we do know that they can be used, like I said before, anything can be used as an adjunct. So um, the gentleman to your right has a, a mask on and then the face shield over it. The face shield is giving him eye protection and double protection over his mouth and nose. So that is totally fine. Next slide. So here is um, a good way to visualize this. Now, again, there is, I'll hit this point multiple times. There is a lot of data coming out. There's some really neat cruise ship data where they looked at one cruise ship mandated masks when there was a COVID outbreak, one did not. And what they found was that um, the on the cruise ship, the, the virus, the amount, the, everyone had masks on, which we think reduced droplets. So even though there was spread, there was a lot more asymptomatic mild disease than significant disease. And, and you, you can see the in the lower picture, um, the woman has a mask on, and you could see the paucity of droplets coming through. In the above picture, you could see the the amount of droplets compared to the below the picture below it. So you could see even without a mask, 
this woman on the top picture is much less protected than the woman on the bottom. So this is really what the mask is doing. Hopefully no droplets are coming out, but even if it's reducing it, that makes a significant improvement in protecting you. And you know, one of the analogies, so a um, Yale epidemiologist was talking about this, and one of the things I heard him say was imagine a castle and it was under attack and you had, you know, a thousand members of your armed forces in your castle and, you know, you had these other defenses and, you know, you had a moat and then a hundred people show up to attack your castle. You're not worried. Yes, they're coming to attack you. Your, your, your own innate forces can defeat them and that is your immune system. Imagine a hundred thousand people coming. It overwhelms your forces and that is your immune system and that is really a large part of these mitigation strategies. Uh, our immune system could do a lot with this, but we just need to kind of, if we're, minimize any exposure and if we're gonna have it, minimize the viral load. Next slide. So understanding PPE, um, masks, like we said, help for two reasons. So the main benefit is protecting other people, not protecting us. And that does it by decreasing droplet spread. Remember, the two main ways are droplets, face-to-face -face and contact with droplets. Has to be worn over your mouth and nose, cannot have a valve, we talked about that. Um, and it also protects the wearer because it protects your mouth and nose from getting droplets in them. And you know, for those of you teachers, I'm sure you've been working with students and they've coughed in your face. As I'm examining kids, they have coughed in my face. We've been there. So having that mask and um, covering your mouth and nose is just another physical barrier. Eye protection is another piece of the puzzle if you're going to be close to students. Um, and eye protection Though glasses, this is better than nothing, um, because my glasses, I don't know how well you could see, um, yeah, my, they, all glasses have kind of openings. So when we talk about eye protection, you really want a face shield or you want to make sure that um, it is, they're like goggles that wrap around. And face shields, there's not enough evidence to show that they could protect others. Um, they can be used as an adjunct um, mask plus face shields. And I am going to just turn my lights on because I um, was pushed down to the basement. I just realized it's getting dark. So give me one second. <sighs> that might make it easier to see. All right, next slide. All right, so what do I think t PPE that teachers should wear? And I am sure there's education coming out to teachers about this. So. I had said this point before, um, in our hospital, what we are currently doing is when we're taking care of COVID positive patients, we just wear surgical mask, eye protection, gown and gloves. When we are seeing regular patients, patients who are asymptomatic, knowing that anyone can be pre-symptomatic and contagious, everyone in our office and everyone in the hospital wears surgical masks. And when we're interacting with patients, we wear eye protection. And what is important to know is when we started all of this, we didn't understand this disease. So there was a lot of concern. Is it aerosolized? Should we use N95 masks? Should everyone have it? There were shortages of N95 masks, besides the fact that I said they are pretty uncomfortable to wear for prolonged periods of time. And so out of kind of a need to see patients, we hoped for the best and we wore surgical masks. Six months into this, we have basically proved that that is a very appropriate way to protect yourself. So this is key because if we in the hospital and office setting can take care one-to-one -one, uh, with a patient who has COVID wearing a surgical mask and eye protection, and that is whether that is um, the you know our custodial help, whether that is our food service staff, whether that is nurses, whether that is doctors, we have had 500 plus patients Average length of stay is 14 days. That is 7,000 days each day with multiple touches. And yet outside of the first kind of month or so, we have really not seen any occupational exposures, knock on wood, because everyone is just following these simple rules and everything has been fine, which makes it much easier to think that we can do this successfully in any other place, whether it's supermarkets, whether it's... Uh, barbershops that are opened, whether it's martial arts places that are open or whether it's in schools. The only time we're using N95 masks are, again, with these aerosolization events. Um, and like I said, it's been shown to be effective. 
And just as, by the way, as we were talking about data, um, I didn't see today's data, but as of last Wednesday, we maxed out about nine, I think it was 89 patients. We worried when this started, we thought we might have, there were some predictions that we would have 900 patients um, at a given time that we, we were building, you know, we had an outside tents. We didn't know where we would say them. We were, we were going to have ICUs um, in the cafeteria. We were really trying to figure out what to do if we had that surge. We maxed at 89 patients. And as of last Wednesday, up through yesterday morning, we had zero patients with COVID in the hospital. And knock on wood, we have not had a patient with COVID die since June. So um, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on throughout the country, but just to represent our community and what's going on here, it's been really reassuring how well the community has band together to kind of protect each other. So getting back to um, PPE and teachers, what do I think they should wear? I think you guys should wear the same thing that we should wear. The same way we feel comfortable protecting ourselves, you should be doing that. So it, face coverings are mandatory, so everyone's going to be wearing that. Um, I think teachers who are going to be interacting with students at a close distance should wear eye protection. Um, at, if you're not, if you're up at the front of the class and you're not going to be interacting, it's fine, especially if you have glasses on, it's probably fine. But one of the things that you, you'll you see as you get back into school, you don't want to keep making these decisions. Should I wear it? Should I not wear it? It takes a lot of mental energy. And, um, and so sometimes it's just easier to say, I'm just going to wear my eye protection at all times when I'm in the classroom. So um, everyone has to wear face coverings. I think teachers that are going to be interacting within six feet of students should wear eye protection as well. Next slide. Hand washing. So um, the face masks and eye and um, and eye coverings are going to protect you from droplet spread for the most part, and hopefully um, uh, everyone protect everyone from droplets being on the on the ground. But let's assume droplets are on common surfaces. You're going to want to do good hand washing. So um, it is more. If I had one thing in terms of droplet precautions, if everyone just washed their hands before touching their mouth, nose, or eyes, no one would get sick that way. So that is more critical than kind of cleaning all the time. Although, like I said, the more you can layer things on top of each other, the better. Next slide. So what happens if a student can't wear a mask? First off, as we have the option for virtual learning, um, students who can't wear a mask, outside of special needs students who are probably the highest priority to get back into school who, from an educational perspective um, or a behavioral perspective where they're getting their therapies, um, outside of those students who won't wear a mask because they're choosing not to or because they're being immature, um, we should likely not be in school. Now, there's not going to be any, there's really no medical indications that for someone not to wear a mask. So teachers should not be worried about um, exemptions for students where they're going to be coming in with notes saying they can't wear a mask. The policy we're going to have is going to say those notes need to be vetted by administration and the medical team. And like I said, there is really not much there. So we would then have to, you know, speak to the provider, really try to understand it. Um, and in the interim, they should be on virtual learning. Students who are refusing to wear a mask, same thing. Um, you know, we, we understand that you might have to redirect a student but if the students, you know, the idea that seventh grade students are going to be throwing their masks around, um, there should be zero tolerance for that in school. I, do, I honestly don't think that there will be. I think um, we have been open since this started. We, through the summer, are seeing checkups and we are, you know, packed with physicals. We are, ha I have had kids, 18 month olds come in with masks on. Everyone has to have a mask to come in. The kids all are saying it's almost like second nature to them. They have had the last few months to acclimate to it. So everyone needs to kind of get their mask endurance up. But I do not expect that to be an issue. And students that were, we would not, from a punitive perspective, we would move them into the virtual environment until they could learn how to wear a mask. Even the special ed students, as we're starting to receive some notes, those notes are not saying they can't wear a mask. Those notes are saying, please allow them to be in school as they're learning how to wear masks. Um, and, you know, the, and the special ed staff is going to be working with them to do the best they can. Next slide. So cleaning, uh, um, what do we want to do? Uh, we wanted to clean 
specifically high touch surfaces, doorknobs, um, and, and then shared objects. So if there are, you know, this becomes really hard for the younger grade teachers that had common like books and you would go and grab those books. You want as much as you can, we're going to want to think how to limit shared objects. We used to have stickers in our, well, we still have stickers in our office. Students would come, or patients would come in and after, you know, they don't, get they don't get candy or something they're leaving they get a sticker but it would be actually a sticker bin um that they would put their hands in or we would we actually had all of us would donate books and we had bookshelves and we said please take a book from our office take it home um we have to eliminate all of those there's no toys there's actually no more waiting room in our office because you want to eliminate any shared objects S surfaces that students will be sitting at um, want you want to clean in between so specifically those are going to be desks and you want it to be where their hands are touching so nobody cares about cleaning the legs of the desk it's the top of the desk or you know the kind of inserts in the desk if they were going to be putting things into them is where you want to clean next slide so there is going to be a subset of teachers um, who have to work with students who can't wear masks, and we can kind of answer this in the Q&A a little bit more, but in general, um, just like we said, you want to layer strategies on. If students cannot wear a mask, um, you want to make sure that you then have extra precautions. So first off, um, there's going to be students who would benefit from seeing your mouth move. There are those clear masks. Not so sure how easy it is to reuse those, um, but lots of people are going to try it, so they are considered safe. Face shields are fine if there is a mask underneath them. But again, we said that they're not a good standalone. Uh, they're not great for standalone um, protection. Um, it gets better. There are drapes that you can add to a face shield, and that kind of makes it a more enclosed um, kind of face covering. So if you needed to use that in special circumstances, that is probably okay. Um, for, for staff that is working and doing one-to-one -one therapy, uh, with students, especially if those students cannot wear a mask, that's when they re we really encourage not just you wearing a face covering or a surgical mask, but you having a face shield on top of that. And if they can't control their secretions, th you should be using gowns um, and probably gloves. Now, those gowns and gloves are in individual for that student. It's to protect you getting droplets on your clothing that you would then go work with another student. So you would need to change your gowns and gloves in between students, not if you're working with one student all day, but if you go, you know, from one student to another. Next slide. Small stable cohorts, the smaller the groups, like we said, the better it is. Um, it is easier in the younger ages, harder in the older kids because there's some educational benefit. They don't all have the same needs in terms of math or language arts. Um, and so it just requires thought by the district, of which I know Hillsborough has done. Um, so there's no magic number that makes a cohort. You know, it doesn't matter if it's 5, 10, 20. It is what it is. But the smaller you can make it, the better you are, um, both to prevent disease and if public health has to come in. Next slide. What are special school um, activities So um, that we need to consider? They're mostly the large gatherings. So we're assemblies that we're not going to have, limit visitors, band and choir. So the band, you know, the, the director of the music programs, uh, there's national guidance on this. There's some extra guidelines that they should follow. Lunch, nobody's really having lunch. But the issue with lunch is masks are off. My worry for school as a FYI, and this is in what we're finding in most industries that open, um, we do not see spread until they let down their guard. And one of the places that people let down their guard is when they go into an area with their colleagues or friends and they eat. So it's not, when you're eating, you have to pull down your mask. So you really wanna make sure that you are, A, have good airflow, B, you have, you're maximizing your physical distance, and there's no reason that you can't take your mask off, eat, and then put your mask back on as you're sitting there chatting with your friends. So the more we do that, the better. Um, and that is why most schools are not opening with lunch to start as we're trying to figure out everything else. Um, gym, um, there's going to be these sport guidelines, and we're going to talk about gym in another slide. Next slide. So as we stand right now, we cannot test out of this for asymptomatic people. Um, the testing, the return time takes too long. Um, there is a potential 
I am hoping before that potential even comes, we have a vaccine and we've beaten this. I, I think we're doing a really good job in the Northeast. Um, but one of the potential strategies is if you could have um, daily tests at home that are these antigen tests and you can look and what we're trying to catch again are these pre-symptomatic people. Catch them in the day or two before they recognize they have symptoms. Um, right now, there's just, that just doesn't exist. Um, so our testing strategy is gonna be much more focused on sick kids and you'll, you'll see in a moment, we're going to talk about that. They're, they're going to be out of school and we're going to be treating everyone like they have COVID unless they could prove to us that they don't. Next slide. Um, gym considerations. Um, and I, I was just making sure that we didn't skip something, but we're okay. So gym considerations. Um, kids can wear masks and exercise. They shouldn't be wearing masks if, if they are having a difficulty breathing, if they're doing vigorous exercise, um, our PE teachers should be wearing their masks. The more we could do this outside, the better. The more you wanna, again, remove, uh, eliminate any shared surfaces as much as possible. The, you know, If you can avoid locker rooms, now is the time to avoid it, and kids should be bringing their own water bottles. Next slide. Um, transportation considerations. So there's some good guidelines on this. Um, we're going to need to use buses. The buses will probably be less crowded than they were before because of the hybrid use and lots of parents are going to be driving kids. Um, ideally, this is another reason we're doing symptom screening at home. So we want to know before they get, we don't want to, the, the parents to rely on us to do the screening. So um, parents will screen them before they get on the bus. Um, for the most part, I imagine most districts are doing, they're making the siblings only sit together. Um, and then they're going to try to, uh, they're going to assign seats the recommendations are always load from the back to the front. You have a stable route um, and then you unload the bus front to back. Um, everyone has to wear masks. You're going to try to maximize distance um, and you're going to minimize other adults on the bus and then clean in between. Next slide. All right. This is what I wanted to make sure we didn't skip. I forgot where we were. This is the third thing. So the, you know, the first mitigation strategy was if your kid is sick or at high risk for getting sick, keep them home. The second one was, what are we going to do if they seem fine to make sure that we don't spread it? And that, that is when we said, we're going to do masking, physical distancing, ventilation, good cleaning, good hand hygiene. And now we get to the third strategy, which is if someone is sick, we're sending them home. So um, the days of watching them in the nurse's office and saying, let's see how they do, we'll then send them back, you know, to the class and then we'll, you know, we'll, they'll come back down. They'll be in the nurse's office, you know multiple hours, three times in the course of a day. Um, if a child is sick, not with an injury and not with a clearly non-COVID related illness, but fever, respiratory or GI illnesses, um, they are going to go home. Those kids should have a mask on when they're sent down. So again, everyone's gonna need a face covering regardless. When they get into the nurse's office, um, I'm asking the nurses to consider if they don't, you know, potentially putting a surgical mask on them just to make sure that it is um, a mask that kind of really reduces droplets. Um, and then the nurse is going to call the family and say, you need to go. Next slide. We are, the, the goal is to get the kids out of school immediately and families are gonna have to be educated that this is the plan. We are not keeping them in school. Um, once they're out, we are going to go under the assumption that any case is possibly COVID if it meets any of those criteria, you know, fever, respiratory symptoms, or GI symptoms. If you have COVID, the guidelines are that you are contagious for at least 10 days from the first day of your symptoms, and you have to be better for 24 hours. So because any of these kids could possibly have COVID, that is going to be the exclusion policy if kids are sick. The only way they get out of Dodge and get back into school is if they meet one of two criteria. Next slide. Criteria one, they have to see a doctor, get tested and be negative for COVID and be better. Criteria two is the physician has to say, there is another good reason that explains these symptoms. Um, and so there's lots of things. So imagine somebody who has um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and they're having a flare-up and so they come in and they're having more you know stomach cramps and diarrhea 
they have no they we send them home we don't know what it is so we say just go home they go see their physician and their gastroenterologist says they've had no exposure they look great this is just a flare-up of their crohn's and gives a note that is something that very specific that we would say okay so if they're feeling better they can come back into school we as we're learning we want to make sure and we're looking to get you know some clarification from the new jersey department of health but we're going to really try to be stringent and make sure that these notes really explain that the kids had a um, appropriate alternative diagnosis. So what we do not want to accept is um, the diagnosis is fever or the diagnosis is virus or cold symptoms. Um, so um, we're hoping for clarification. We um, will have a Q&A with the assistant health commissioner next Monday. Um, but there is uh, that is our plan is we're going to want to make sure that we have those notes and that those notes are submitted a day in advance so we have time to vet them and make sure that it seems appropriate. Next slide. Let's go through the scenario of what happens if there's a positive case. So there's a lot of misinformation. So I'm going to give you this. Um, Siobhan can obviously correct me if I am wrong, but we've went through this, so I um, think I have it down pat. Um, so first, this is going to take a lot of communication between our district and the Department of Health. Um, as an FYI, um, anyone who knows if you ever get diagnosed and you're COVID positive, um, never be afraid to call the Department of Health. The Department of Health gets notified for positive cases from the commercial labs, but that notification can take up to a few days. It's an electronic notification through systems. And the, the more we notify them about positive cases and the earlier we do it, the better they could do their contact tracing. So the Department of Health is going to act on a confirmed case, of course, or what we call a probable case. So as it stands right now, and we're going to uh, make sure we get clarification from the Depart from the New Jersey Department of Health um, that uh, on this. But if there is a possible case, so there is somebody who has symptoms, yet we're in this low to medium risk environment in school, the child is going to go home. We're going to say you need to prove to us that you don't have COVID. But that is not something that will trigger the Department of Health to come in. Um, we will just move on. Now, if we start to see a run of cases in a classroom, it's going to be important to say, hey, something's going on here. And that was always true. If there was a lot of illness, you know, the school would talk to the local Department of Health. What will be a probable case is if there's any of those symptoms and a known exposure. Now, remember, if there is a known exposure, you're supposed to be quarantined, so you shouldn't be in school. So those cases shouldn't be there. Um, the other way we call a probable case is if there's symptoms and they came from a high-risk area. Again, those kids should not be in school. So it should be very unlikely, if everyone's doing their due diligence, that we actually meet the case definition of a probable case where there is someone in school who develops symptoms who was in that known exposure period for 14 days. But let's say there is, so it's either probable or a confirmed case. Siobhan gets called. They're going to come in and say, and work with the school and say, where was this child? What was the cohort? Who were they with? And they're going to look at who are they in within six feet for 10 to 15 minutes or more. Like we said before, if it is a teacher who was at the front of the class and that teacher, uh, he or she says, I was up here. I was never near those kids. I, you know, everyone had their mask on. They were at their desks. I was always up here. That teacher would not necessarily need to, that teacher would not be quarantined. If it, um, same thing with the students to get even to, if they were all, all more than six feet away, they would not be quarantined to get into more detail. Let's assume they were all five feet away from each other. If, but they sat at their desks as they drew a circle around those child, if that there was an index case and there were three students who were within six feet because they were just five feet away, those students would be quarantined. The other students who were, were would be outside of this six feet circle. So they might be five feet from the, a student who was exposed, but they were more than six feet from the index case. Those students would not necessarily need to be quarantined. Again, if we don't know and you say we were all in the class, we were just walking around, we don't know and how long we were exposed to each other, then in that situation, they would quarantine the class. Remember, quarantining just means during this potential exposure period where you're in the incubation period, we think the incubation period in general is five days. It could go up to 14 days. It's usually within the first week we see symptoms. So we're trying to say, 
you were exposed. We're going to move you home and say, don't be around anyone else. So if you develop symptoms, even if you were in the time that you were pre-symptomatic, the day or two before you develop symptoms, you had no exposures. Maybe your household contact because you were in the house, but not to anyone else. So that's the point of quarantining. Remembering that there's a lot of media coverage over, oh my God, you know, uh, uh, there was the California case where principals and superintendents met in person, and then one principal ended up getting diagnosed with COVID, and it was it might have been over a hundred people they say were quarantined. Um, zero of them got sick, so they got quarantined, but nobody got sick. Same thing for the Minnesota barbers. There were two that had COVID. I think it was over a hundred people there as well that were exposed getting haircut by two people with COVID, all of those people got quarantined, nobody got sick. So the ideal will be our mitigation strategies should protect us, but to really err on the side of precaution, on the side of caution, we'll quarantine those people for 14 days. Next slide. So if there's a positive case, a note goes out to the school, um, the, they will not identify who the teacher is or who the child is. Um, parents, I'm sure, will talk about it and try to figure out because they'll say they'll know if there is a class who is exposed and therefore quarantined, they'll, I'm sure, you know, put, post that on Facebook or talk to their friends. But um, this is, you know, for HIPAA protection, you know, the, the student or teacher will never be identified. Now, the school will not shut down if there is a case. That is not, you know, they will quarantine that room They'll leave it alone. They'll clean after 24 hours, um, but the school will not shut down. It is possible, as we talk through this, that if the call came in right now at like 8 o'clock at night, um, they they might shut it down for a day. So Siobhan and her team have the time to talk to the, the administration and nursing staff so they can do the contact tracing, um, but they will not shut it down. A second case will not shut it down. God forbid you start to see an increased prevalence or multiple cases. Um, that's going to be a decision that the local Department of Health will make with the school, and that might change things. But one case is not shutting down the school. Next slide. Most likely. Common concerns that came up in questions. So contacts of contacts do not need to be quarantined. This is a phrase you'll hear public health people talk about. So what does that mean if there is an index? case in a class that gets that we find out had quarantine that had COVID and they were in school today. Um, and even if all those kids were just with each other, they were not maintaining their six feet physical distancing, they would get quarantined. Their siblings are not at risk. Their parents are not at risk right now. They do not need to be quarantined. That student would stay home. Now, if that student at some point in the incubation period became positive, then that student is now contagious and they draw that he or she becomes a new index case. And now those household contacts would likely be quarantined unless they had a way that they had separated themselves from the house. Um, so um, what this also means is that if there is a teacher who um, goes to multiple classes and in one class she came in and she was an art teacher and she was um, helping students and she was close one to one and it, and she went to four different classes. Each class had 20 kids in it. And one class had the index case. And let's say that whole class, including the teacher, were considered exposed and quarantined. Even though the teacher went to the three other classes, they are fine. She was not able to spread anything at, at that time. Um, and then the last thing, you, although it is fine to get tested while you're in this exposure period where you are quarantined, there is not enough data that a negative test, it's a point in time that you could test out of it. So even if you wait till day five, day seven, you are still quarantined for the 14 days. Next slide. So we are getting to the end. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, uh, stuff keeps changing. This is just from this past Thursday. Um, New Jersey put out their guidelines. Next slide. And these guidelines will unfold, but they will break people into low, moderate, high risk, and then very high risk. Um, as we look at the data, this is the first week that they're looking at this. Um, I think that they're going to have to um, they're going to have to kind of tweak this a little bit. Um, but in general, 
they're doing basically the same thing that we have talked about. In low risk areas where we're basically saying there's no disease, they're treating it as imagine there's no disease. And if someone tested positive for COVID, you treat them as COVID. Most of the time, I think we're going to be operating under this moderate risk area. We're going to seem we're going to assume that there's low to moderate disease in the community. So we're going to be really cautious. We're going to have these mitigation strategies where we're going to employ masks, the physical distancing, and we're going to be cautious, send kids home if they're sick. Um, but we are only going to act and call the Department of Health if they are sick, if, if it becomes a probable case. High risk is if we, you know, this would be like states like California right now. Um, and I, and when, you know, depending if they fall into high or very high risk, I suspect if we ever got into either of these um, and we're in a sustained fashion, um, that Governor Murphy would not allow schools to persist. Next slide. Um, this goes through their guidelines on how you're going to exclude kids, which is basically everything we just talked about. Um, next slide. So it's just nice, the plans that we were coming up with, they're kind of um, confirming that that's how they want us to act. And again, this is from the, the Department of Health uh, confirming suggestions for how to intervene. And you know, if there's a confirmed case in school, the school remains open, staff in school in close contact with positive case are excluded for 14 days. Um, and it goes on to just say the more cases you're going to work, you know, we're going to work with Siobhan and the nurses and administration and figure out what the right thing to do is. Um, next slide. Nursing guidelines. So we can talk about this with the nurses um, offline, but uh, basically sick kids should be sent home. We're going to need to communicate this to parents. Parents are going to have to be on board. Um, nebulizers we're not going to do in school and the nurses all have to have a way to isolate the kids um, so that they are not kind of at least six feet apart wearing their masks when they're in uh, when they're in the school uh, nurse's office. Next slide. Nurse PPE guidelines, again, I'll go through that with the nurses um, in more detail, but in general, um, for all kids, this is when the nurses are dealing with any kids, they should obviously be wearing a surgical mask. And because they're hands-on, they should be wearing eye protection, like I think teachers should, and they should be you know, using gloves in between patient care. If the child is sick, um, they likely only only need the same protection. Remember, in the hospital, we are just doing the same thing. Um, but if they have to be in close proximity, they should likely put a gown on during that time um, just to protect their clothing from being able to expose someone else. And um, if that child cannot wear a mask uh, for some for whatever reason and they're in close proximity, they should consider extra protection. Um, so either they should wear a surgical mask and a face shield or an N95 mask. Next slide. For anyone who does sports here, um, we do not know the impact of COVID-19 infection and heart disease. And so there is concern, so there's not a lot of data about this, but there's concern that it could, um, that, you know, and you've seen clots from this, that this could be a vascular disease as well. So there is, um, on the new health history questionnaires, there's questions about COVID. Um, if for any nurses or anyone who's looking at those, if there is a yes question that's gonna need more kind of detailed clearance from the pediatrician, the general thoughts right now are that if you have COVID-19, they want a period of time, not only where you can return to activities just back to school where you're not infectious, but if you had mild disease, they want you out for two to four weeks afterwards just to make sure that your heart has time to kind of rest and recover before and that, you know, and then we do slow increase in exercise. If you had any more significant disease, the general recommendations, especially for kids who are older, are to see a cardiologist. And you know, some of those kids, you know, if they were significantly ill, they're going to want them out for three to six months, assuming that they might have a viral, myocard a viral cardiomyopathy. Next slide. All right, so we're closing and then we're going to get to questions. So how do you open school safely? Um, again, as you're thinking this through, you have to think through what your prevalence is. We will be, we will look much, much better if we are opening in an area where there is low prevalence and our data right now looks as good as it's going to look. I think if we all do our due diligence, I think it's going to hover here. 
um, there is the potential if people stop doing the stuff that it could go up, but it is hard to get this disease significantly lower here. The rest of the country has got a lot of catching up to do, um, but we, uh, until there is a vaccine, this we're going to hover in this kind of low prevalence area. Um, we need to get the community on board. They are on board with everything else. I don't imagine that they wouldn't be, but it's going to take education um, about what our policies are going to be, that they cannot send kids to school if they were exposed or if they were sick. We're going to have to be adamant about face coverings. So the governor said we have to have them. It is the right thing to do. We could, as a country, beat this if everyone just wore face coverings. We'd be able to open up a lot more. And face coverings don't always have to be perfect. Like People are going to futz around with them. But the more, you know, this is a droplet spread disease for the most part. The more we keep those droplets in, the better everyone's going to be. We're going to maximize whenever you can physical distancing, improve environmental controls. We're going to limit these kind of super spreader events. Um, and we're going to be really conservative in our policies, understanding that we're going to inconvenience people. But it is, um, you know, we are right now saying if we're going to open, we need to open in a way that we do it safely. Next slide. Um, the district needs to make sure that they have policies and education about this, clarity on you know, what type of face coverings. Again, no valves, I think, and that, uh, that face coverings need to be over the mouth and nose. Um, clarity on what our mask exemptions are. Um, clarity that we are going to um, recommend and enforce the travel quarantines. Um, and you know, we're going to have to work through what we do with siblings of sick children, you know, whether or not you send them home. There's actually no guidance, and lots of people say, you can leave them. There's some people who say you have them go home the same day. We're going to have to just, you know, decide as a district what we want to do with that. Um, I think it is probable confirmed cases. It is a no brainer. They have to be out. Um, but when we're dealing with most illnesses we're going to see are going to be non COVID related viral illnesses. It's probably fine to allow a sibling to stay in school. Next slide. So, we're going to learn as we go. And if we do this smartly and open up with a low prevalence, um, especially, you know, I, I and I just heard right before we did this uh, about what the Hillsborough's new policy is going to be. Um, so if it is that we're going to have another few weeks to make sure that you have appropriate PPE and cleaning supplies, it's an ideal time to kind of get this education out there. Um, and I can't think of a better way to open than a soft opening like with this, where we have low prevalence, we're going to have a low volume of students in the class for a short amount of time. Um, New Jersey and the districts that I've talked to are really doing everything possible. Like this is, I, th I think we're going to be able to prove from a safety perspective, Perspective that we can do this safely and um, I hope we get an opportunity I hope the numbers stay low enough that we could you know see as we go and learn from this and that is where we'll finally end an hour and a half for maybe a little under so I apologize for the length but hopefully it was uh, it answered a lot of the questions absolutely dr. Mandelbaum it was it was very reasonable and and very um, eye-opening quite frankly because there is so much miscommunication, uh, mis so many misconceptions. And also, be as you stated several times, it just keeps changing. And so it's so important to be right where we are. I believe that Mr. Callahan, people have been sending in questions and Mr. Callahan uh, does have them. So he's going to read them off. I'm sure he's probably chunked some of those that are the same and that sort of thing. So Mr. Callahan, you can go ahead. I'll mute myself and you can go ahead. Dr. Mandelbaum and Shaban, thank you so much for sharing your tremendous expertise this evening with our staff. The district really does appreciate it. As you know, we've had questions coming in in real time. And while time will preclude us from getting to all questions this evening, we really do appreciate you addressing a good number of questions. And with that, the first question is, how many active cases are currently in Hillsborough? Well, if you're going to talk about uh, new cases per week, we have between one and five a week, and a lot of them are related to each other. So we're very low at this point. Thank you. And next, is there any concern with unknown long-term side effects of asymptomatic COVID-positive pediatric patients? Yes. <laughs> so um, there is... Um, about oh, uh, 
last week, um, I ran a grand rounds at Penn Medicine, and the speaker I brought in was the chief of infectious disease at um, at CHOP. And we went through COVID and kids. And it was interesting because we got like the data, the short term data is really reassuring. And the long term data is unknown. And that unknown is scary. Um, now, most viruses generally don't have significant long term consequences. We have seen in adults um, that this disease, though it's spread through droplets, it's not just only a respiratory disease. And you might see like media coverage over that. We know part of our um, strategy in the hospital and why we've been so much more successful as a, in the hospital and across the country is we've learned some strategies, not only how to prevent the disease, but how to treat it. And some of that is treating out other things that, other than respiratory symptoms like anticoagulating. So we don't know the long-term benefits I mean, the long term health risks. And there's just no way to know it. Like, so we don't know. We're, we have to go into this cautiously. Um, the question came up about <laughs> point blank. We had said, like, what, how scared would you be of your kids getting this? And the infectious disease doc had said, in the short term, I would be more worried about my kids getting the flu than COVID. But in the long term, I would be more worried about COVID because it's unknown. So to answer the question, um, I think we have to really, I, I think nobody should be kind of um, blasé about this. I don't think any kids should be out there saying it's no big deal. I would love to get COVID. This is, you know, made up. Um, I think we should be careful about it um, and cautious. But um, the data so far has not shown us anything to be overly concerned. Uh, the data so far for kids are reassuring. Thank you. Um, several preschool teachers submit different versions of the next question. For students who need diaper, diapering and toileting, what do you recommend? Um, should this be done with specific PPE that you would recommend? Should there be a designated changing area? Should there be a procedure for disposing of soiled diapers? Yeah, um, excellent question. So um, uh, kudos to those preschool teachers. I have talked nonstop about this. Like I feel like I could close my eyes and do this talk. Um, I haven't got that question yet. So um, the answer will be, um, first off, one of the lucky things that has come out of this is that um, the younger the student is, the less likely they are to be contagious. So somewhat of the balancing act of those students are, it's harder to have our mitigation strategies be successful because a lot of times they can't wear masks and you got to be in close proximity, but they are less likely to spread it. So I think as always, um, we, as you're doing diaper changes, everyone should have been wearing gloves at that point. Um, I'm not really worried about gowns because they don't have, you know, part of the kids spreading it. I didn't talk about it earlier, um, but another aspect of this is because it's droplet spread, the larger your kind of expiratory volume, the more likely it is that you can create more droplets. So the younger kids cannot do that as much. Um, I think that if you're gonna be close to a, a, um, a child though, they should be wearing a surgical mask and a face shield. So I would have surgical mask, face shield, and gloves um, on any common surface. They should be cleaning it. That's probably good practice that they were doing regardless, And um, but you wanna clean in between. You partially actually addressed the next question in, in what you were just speaking with, but can you speak, um, what's the, what is the spread rate from asymptomatic younger students? Uh, so um, we know younger kids spread it less. Um, we, and we do not have a lot of data. Like there was a, one of the studies that came out and got another, again, a lot of press because people were assuming these black and white students cannot spread it. Kids under 10 cannot spread it. So there was a study that came out of South Korea that looked at kids who had disease, how often they were the primary focus of spreading it to their household contacts. Most of the time, so it was like 10% of the time that that happened. Almost always when kids had disease, it came adult to child. So the younger they are, the less less likely they are to spread. The less symptomatic they are, the less likely they are to spread. And we don't really know, there's actually no way to prove that asymptomatic people who never develop symptoms can spread it. If they have a measurable viral load, we think they can, um, but it is really hard to track exactly who spread, who spread it to you. So uh, I think the answer would be really unlikely. That is not, that is one of my lowest concerns would be the asymptomatic 
preschool child spreading it. Although I would still be cautious with the PPE. I, you know, these are um, one of the ways that I rest that I feel more comfortable with this is remembering if that was an adult patient with COVID in the hospital and you had to change their diaper, they had, you know, they needed help. They would be wearing a surgical mask, goggles and gloves and be fine as they change their diaper as an, as a geriatric patient with COVID because it's an adult, they would probably be wearing a gown with COVID. Um, but if they could do that for a geriatric patient who has COVID and be okay, we should be okay as we're dealing with asymptomatic pediatric patients. Thank you for that. With regard to droplets, can droplets travel further than six feet due to ventilation, fans, et cetera? Yeah, so I think that the answer is um, yes. Um, and we don't know, like this is, uh, again, uh, some of the information that gets a lot of press was the initial restaurant study in China and there was an air conditioning vent blowing. So in general, um, the droplets are heavy and most of them fall to the ground. So big, large particles do not really spread. It's the smaller aerosolized particles can, can spread. And the more fresh air ventilation and the more the kind of air gets circulated in the room, the most of the time these droplets are just kind of, the, even the smaller ones are hanging around. They're not floating around. Um, and as you have air circulation, it moves around and then slowly kind of gets to a wall or drops to the ground. And because the inoculum, the amount of virus you need to get sick, is not insignificant, we generally don't think that there's a lot of disease that way. But that is why when we talk about ventilation, like it, it is probably not great to be in a room without windows, with poor ventilation and no air circulating. If there was someone who had an index case who was coughing and aerosolizing a little bit, it could, it is possible for it to travel, especially if you're close, but it is generally not in far distances. Thank you. And the, related to that, there is a question about humidity and does the virus thrive in humidity? And is there a concern for indoor area, indoor areas that are high in humidity? Yeah, you know, we, we can't figure it out. Like, so if you look worldwide, like there's not a place that is free of COVID right now. So I, I remember my parents were like, it's going to go away in the summer. And I'm like, it's in Iran right now. It's pretty hot there. Like, it's not, you know, I, I'm not so sure that like, um, that heat is going to make it go away. So it could survive on surfaces, you know, a little longer, a little shorter, but the kind of you know, things like humidity and the temper ambient temperature of the school is not going to be a game changer. Thank you. Um, next question is about masks. At what temperature and for how long would you deem it safe to, to be wearing a mask indoors with, um, in areas that with or without climate control? I don't think that there's um, a right answer to that. So um, I there's no data that I'm aware of, of a particular temperature um, that makes it that you can't wear a mask, depending on the thickness of the mask. Like for anyone, everyone's gotten used to wearing masks. When you started to do, when I started to wear a mask and we did not wear it in the office, as I complained to my like surgical colleagues, they'd be like, dude, I, I wear it eight hours in the OR, like get over it. It's not a big deal. And you start to build up a mask tolerance. Um, so um, I think that there is, Everyone's going to get used to it. I think, can you wear a mask in school for seven hours in a full day? Absolutely. Are there, is it nice to be able to get mask breaks at times? Sure. If you could safely get a mask break, it's fine. But um, I don't think that there is going to be um, an issue with that. Now, there were, there was an Israeli outbreak of after school started. And that Israeli outbreak corresponded with like a heat wave when they had poor ventilation and because it was so hot and they couldn't open the windows um, they had the kids take the masks off so they removed one of the mitigation strategies which was not great so um, that should not like I would be more worried if you were a school in a hot climate area that didn't have air conditioning should not be an issue as you know we're getting into September October in our schools should be fine Thank you. The next question is, is pertaining to masks and quarantine decisions, um, indicating they read on the CDC mm -hmm. website that it doesn't matter if you're wearing a mask or not when determining Correct. who needs to be quarantined after exposure to an infected person. Are you yep. saying that if students and a teacher have a mask on during close contact, we wouldn't recommend um, 
that, that, that they quarantine. No, not at all. They, that person was right. Exactly. So in the medical community, so in my office, if there was a case and, and what, or one of our physicians or staff um, uh, had COVID, they will count masks. So in healthcare settings, masks count. So if you, you could be within six feet or, you know, in more than 15 minutes, and if you had a mask on, that would not count as an exposure because they trust that their surgery masks and the healthcare professionals know what they're doing in the um, outside of the healthcare settings they will not count masks so in the school setting that person is absolutely right they will use six feet and 10 or 15 minutes um, for an exposure the idea is and this is why I want to reinforce it even though they're not counting the masks those masks will hopefully be the strategy that prevents anyone 14 days later from having disease but they will just during that 14 day, they will when they have to figure out quarantining, they are going to just look at six feet, 15 minutes. So, again, hallways won't count if you're passing. You know, I, I walk by that kid in the hallway. That doesn't count. Um, and uh, in the classroom, it's going to be can you sit them more than six feet apart and keep them in their seats? Thank you. The district's hybrid plan is to have 70 minute periods at the high school level. Does the extra length of time make it any more likely that a spread could occur? I don't think so. Uh, you know, that I spread. Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think that there's any, you know, 55 minute versus 70 minute classes. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that's an issue. OK, thank you. Um, we, we have students with food reinforcers in their IEPs. Is it safe to provide students with that food as they would be taking um, taking masks on and off and potentially touching their faces as they're eating? You, um, you guys have great questions. <laughs> um, so um, almost everything, like this talk might be somewhat annoying because everything is nuanced. There's no absolutes. You have to understand it. So if I could use a non-food reinforcer, I sure would. If I can't, then you would do it and you would, you know, we understand that there's going to be special needs kids who are not going to be able to keep their mask on. And if they could take their mask off and use the food reinforcer and put their mask back on, that's better. But during yeah. those times, I would end up um, being more careful and that those staff members probably need an extra layer of protection. That's when I would be doing surgical mask and face shield. Thank you. This next question comes from a teacher who teaches students with autism. Uh, they write with the concern that their students may struggle to keep their masks on and they work face to face with these children. Um, what approach is suggested to, to keep this teacher safe? Yeah, it's, this is like one of the hardest things, right? There's probably um, very few kids who need in-person schooling more than that child and the therapies and help that they're getting. And yet they'll be difficult to, that child will be difficult to keep their mask on. So um, first off, this is why it's so important that we're opening in a low prevalence community because um, the lower the prevalence, the lower the risk is that of that child and um, being sick. And you really want to make sure that family is doing good screening. But then as you're working one on one with them, anytime you can, you are removing one protective factor, which is like the mask for this child, the more you should add something else to yourself. So if you can add physical distancing or a barrier, that's great. If you could have a surgical mask and a face shield, that's great. Um, we had said if you're gonna, if they can't control their secretions, you should probably have a gown on, and that gown is just for use for that student. And we might find these students. I had a child. I had two kids today in my office. One was five. One was twenty-four. We have sometimes we have, they won't leave, and you know, they, um, and um, both wore a mask the entire time during the physical so not everyone can but through behavioral modification they can learn it and like we said before face shields are not going to be um, considered um, all routine allowable face coverings for the general ed student however if a if a child with special needs could wear a face covering I mean wear a face shield instead of because they can't wear a mask that's better than nothing so the more we can employ um, the better that everyone will be. Thank you. And Shaban, I think the next question is likely for you. Not everyone is compliant with testing and tracing. How do we know the accuracies with regards to reports uh, regarding active cases? 
Well, most of the people are pretty cooperative um, and we're looking at trends too. We're not just looking at the numbers of cases. So, um, and we do also have probable cases out there that are not always reported. So we're looking at the increases and um, so we still get a pretty good idea. Plus we look at the countywide, you know, numbers and the statewide numbers. It's not just the small numbers in, you know, in Hillsborough, the smaller the numbers you have, the less accurate they are. So you really have to look at the, at the, you know, the local uh, township numbers, the county numbers and the state numbers before you, you make any decisions. And I think that um, the way that the state is looking at it with the regional area, we have three counties that we're looking at um, together and to see, you know, what the rates are and what, what's going on in that area to make these decisions. So I think that gives us a good idea. Thank you so much. With regards to, to one specific facility question, what would be advised if a health office does not have an outside window? I don't know. You want to make sure you, uh, you want to make sure they have good ventilation. You know, so I think like any other area in the school, um, you want to make sure that there's kind of and and there are guidelines for. Um, that are above my head for the HVAC and airflow, um, but not most places don't have open windows. Like that's okay as long as you have good, you know, you have good airflow through the room and good ventilation. We should be fine. Thank you. And and if it's okay, I'm actually gonna gonna combine various questions about masks. And um and and if you need me, to, if you want to interject as I'm speaking, absolutely feel free. How often do you need to change a, sur a uh, surgical mask? in a day? Do they get tossed out at the end of the day? Of the day? Can they be hand washed? Um, <laughs> okay, that, and it's fine to have as one question. So the answer, here's the clear answer. Um, if it seems wet or soiled and broken down, you should probably not use that mask and you should either launder it if it's a cloth mask or get rid of it. So when we started, we had a shortage of PPE. We did not know that we could get surgical masks and we had to see patients. We, we said one mask per week, unless it gets soiled, like we're gonna use it and like we would take it, put it in a plastic, in a paper bag um, and um, take it home and then use it again. And actually it was just fine. Like they stayed pretty, you know, and we've been working under that assumption. I think the general guidelines for surgical masks are that you use one a day. Um, you could definitely extend it more than that. But again, if they get wet, that's when they start to kind of fall apart. Cloth masks, the recommendation are that they're laundered every day and they can actually absolutely be washed. You know, we have a bin of masks in my house and, you know, they just get, you know, we have a clean bin, we have a dirty bin and, you know, every, once a week we wash all the masks. Um, again, there are various questions on this. Speech therapists need children to see their mouths um, how about ma masks with uh, where the, ma the mouth opening is shown, or there is a specific question about the Envo respirator mask? I don't think I know the Envo respirator mask, but there's clear masks. So there's a, a few variations of clear masks that are obviously great, you know. So, uh, and the ones that I have seen, the um, they're, they seem less substantial so that I don't know how reusable they were and they're, they get a little expensive. Um, it, this becomes an issue. Again, we're going to have to carve out certain things. Like when you're doing speech therapy and the ch kids need to see your face, um, there, there, those are times where the speech therapist and or the student might need to use just a face shield. If you're doing that, the, the more you can use a barrier so you can have a plexiglass barrier or have physical distancing, the better you are. So you, again, you're employing other kind of strategies layered on top of it. And, and we're, we're nearing the end, I, I promise you both. Um, with regard to the virus on surfaces, um, several questions specifically about books. How long can we safely assume the virus, if it was present, is no longer viable on a surface such as a, a book. And this is coming from the standpoint, for instance, can the school library and or literacy teacher loan out novels or books and how long would they need to sit after getting them back before they would absolutely know that the, the virus, if it was present, um, was no longer viable? 
Um, Siobhan, do you, I, I was going to say off the top of my head, 72 hours in general, but I don't know if on paper there's some data that it could last a little longer. I think 72 hours is a comfortable number, Siobhan. Yeah, I think so. Think? But, you know, the thing is, we're going food shopping, we're touching everything. And is it, if, as long as you're washing your hands, you know, when you're, after you're reading the book, um, you know, I don't, I, you can't always be 100% sure somebody, you know, isn't going to, you know, sneeze on something, even if you're food shopping or whatever. So uh, the hand washing part is the most important. Um, you know, you take the book home, you, you can clean it off a little bit, keep it aside for a little while. And then after you're reading the book, you wash your hands and you don't touch your face. You know, I'm, you know, you could put things away for a while, but I think the 72 hours was about what it was for the paper for paper. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the virus cannot live forever. So that is for sure. Like there is a time frame that the virus cannot live outside the body, um, definitely outside of a week. Like that is just, it's not going to survive that. But I generally think 72 hours. So, you know, um, and, and Siobhan's right. Like we talked about this before, that if you don't, no matter what you do, if you wash your hands, you'd be fine. If you clean them, they'd be fine. But there's going to be, I understand that teachers and libraries are, you know, they're not going to, Maybe it's possible we can wipe down each book, but um, if you want to just be able to say we're going to rest them for a bit and then put them back on the shelf, that's probably okay. And I think seventy-two hours is probably fair. And our uh, our, our last question refers directly to to us transitioning back. The district is having teachers primarily report to their classrooms during the initial phase of remote learning. And what do you see yep. as the as the potential risk of teachers in their classroom without students present contracting uh, COVID-19 during those first three weeks as we transition back in? Um, if everyone um, understands and wears face coverings and washes their hands and maintains physical distancing, I think that risk is as close to zero as can be. If people forget to do those things, the risk could go up. But this is how, um, you know, we have um, over 100 employees who work for our practice. We have six offices. We see probably at this point, we're probably seeing 150 to 200 patients a day with their families. And people go, it, it, it took us a while. We were, you know, let me actually back up and just remind everyone, like, I understand like this is super anxiety provoking, right? So we went through, um, when this happened mid early, end of February, early March, we thought that this was a flu-like virus. We didn't think it was gonna be much. All of a sudden the world is shut down. We don't know what's going on and we think it's living on Cheerios and you know, we can't touch, we don't know what to touch. Um, and we had to see patients and we had a few people who were pretty, not even optimistic, they were, um, they, they were desensitized and they were like, this is no big deal, um, inappropriately so. But we had a lot of people who were like, we know we have a job to do, but we're really scared. And the job felt very different than what it used to be. Like it was very, you know, we were now telehealth to see someone, any patient we saw, we were like, can you give us this disease that we don't understand that we might die from? Um, and we had a certain subset that were so scared that said like, it's not worth it. I want to, you know, I want to time out. And they took a few weeks leave of absence. As we started to learn what it was and how to handle it, things went back to normal. And it was only through that couple of weeks of being exposed to people, we were, were on edge, we started to get comfortable with it, we knew how to wash our hands. And then next thing you know, we were just back, to, everyone came back and we were back to doing what we were doing and everyone's okay, knock on wood. Um, so what do I expect? I expect everyone to be fine. Now, if everyone came in and they tried to pretend like this was pre-COVID, and they were like, I don't want to wear my mask and I'm staying and I was coughing today and I decided to come in anyway. And you're sitting in your teacher conference room with another friend with, you know, talking about, you know, how your kids are driving you crazy over the summer. Um, it's possible someone will get sick if everyone comes in and is on their best behavior and you could you talk to your friends, but you try to maintain physical distancing, you wash your hands, you have your face coverings on. Um, there's no reason to think that it would be any different than anyone in any other environment. ShopRite, Trader Joe's, the barbershop. When you go, wherever you go, you should be totally fine. 
Thank you so much. Thank you both of you for uh, sharing your, your fantastic expertise. We really do uh, appreciate that and appreciate all that you do for the school community. Uh, well, we appreciate teachers. We, there's no, you know, there is nothing. Uh, if I thought for a moment, I, I didn't want the school open when it was back in March and April. Like we, we were worried. If I thought for a moment that we couldn't do this safely, I would say it. And if I thought that you were being overly aggressive, I would say it. This is as cautious as we could be to open. Um, and I hope that we get a chance to do it. And I hope and I really hope that we get to look back and say that we were successful because of everyone's efforts. Thank you. And thank you to all of our uh, all of our staff for joining in from home this evening. Dr. Antunes, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share? Uh, I really don't. Just another thank you to both Dr. Mandelbaum and Ms. Spano for taking the time to be here with us tonight. And honestly, thank you for everybody who is listening, who joined us this evening as well. We sort of put it out there as voluntary and and it, it just speaks again to the heart of, of our staff and that, that they're willing to come out and, and listen. So thank you to everybody. Thank you again and, and have, a, have a great night. Um, uh, yeah, and thank you. Thanks, uh, I agree. Thank you to everyone for trying to um, learn a little and bearing with us. So good luck to everybody and um, be safe. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.